Hello, everyone. We thought we'd start a couple minutes early and ask where everyone's tuning in from today. I think, um, are all of us on the panel today in the Lower Mainland? I know I'm just about an hour out of Vancouver, BC. Yeah, I'm right in Vancouver. Yeah, I'm just outside in the suburbs, but close to Vancouver too. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in from all over. Yeah, one of the funny things about putting together a webinar on debugging workflows, I found, is that it's actually really hard to create a workspace that breaks when you when you want it to. They always break when you don't want them to. So <laughs> that's been a lot of fun for Laura and I, uh, trying to come up with workflows that uh, the break on demand. <laughs> mm -hmm. It takes some creativity. I had one that I had a whole, like a heck of a time troubleshooting and debugging back a few months ago when I was building it. And I went to go grab it again to use for this webinar to show off as an example and it wouldn't break. Like it was totally fine now, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. So <laughs> just good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, well, it is that time. So why don't we go ahead and kick things off? So welcome everyone uh, to our Don't Bug Out, the ins and outs of debugging FME workflows. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at uh, just different tips and tricks and techniques for uh, different ways to handle unexpected results in your workspaces or error messages. And so just learning where to go for those different situations and the tools that are available uh, to help you figure out what's going on in your workspaces. Uh, so my name is Laura Wu. I'm the Director of Customer Support here at SAFE. So I, I've seen a few broken workspaces in my day. Um, so I'll be able to, to share a little bit about what I've found in helping customers troubleshoot. I'll let Mark introduce yeah, himself. Yeah, and I'm Mark Stokes, and I've been with SAFE for uh, a while and also good at uh, debugging workflows when they come my way. So I'm going to turn my camera off so we've got more screen space here. So uh, what are we going to cover in the next 45 minutes or so? Um, so we're going to look at uh, when things do go off the rails. Um, just as we mentioned, uh, when you encounter problems at all stages of building your workflows, and so that can be a bit irritating. And so how do we troubleshoot those and find out what's going on? Yeah, and we'll also take a look at some tools for debugging workspaces, so directly in FME desktop, so the different places you can go there. Then we'll take a look at testing and debugging an FME server, um, see what some of the differences are in that environment. Then we'll wrap up and we'll, we'll give a chance for everyone to ask questions if you've got anything that you, you'd like to learn a little bit more about as well. So I have developed a workflow, but uh, hit a roadblock and uh, got unexpected results or error messages. Uh, well, that's a bit of a rhetorical question. I'm sure everybody who's worked in the FME products has encountered some problem or another. Um, and uh, so we hope to help you uh, work yourselves through that. Yeah, and for a non-rhetorical question, just to kind of get things going here, you've seen the panel from earlier, but um, yeah, what is your preferred tool when you're troubleshooting your workspaces? So what is your go-to technique to figure out what's going wrong when you're, you're seeing either errors or perhaps the data that you're getting in your results isn't quite what you expected? You let us know through the, the panel there. Just a few uh, key words on defining uh, what we call problems. So testing, uh, the process of finding where errors are. There is a subtle difference between all these things when you look them up on uh, Wikipedia and other places. Troubleshooting, tracking down the root cause of issues and debugging the actual process of correcting the errors that you found. Uh, going off the rails, maybe not such an official term but or technical term, but uh, perhaps occurs when we all get a little frustrated when we can't find out what's uh, going wrong. So uh, when are things likely to go off the rails and need uh, troubleshooting? So during workbench authoring, um, you know, testing how a transformer works. So you might have a more complex transformer and want to fiddle around with the parameters and not get the results you want. So you've got to be able to check those results and see what's uh, going on. 
um, experimenting with different transformers, we kind of have quite a lot of functionality in FME that seems to overlap. So point on area overlayer, spatial filter, spatial relator, they all do very similar tasks. And so maybe you need to just uh, figure out uh, what the subtleties of those are. Um, bad or unexpected data, oops. Um, so this is a very likely cause of issues. We all think we have above average quality data, but uh, someone out there must have below average data if our data is above average. So, um, so the data quality is uh, often a big issue when debugging. Uh, when the data changes, so if you've been working with a sample data set when you've been authoring your workflow, then you might so switch it over to your full data set. Um, that will bring out new issues potentially, or if a user gives you fresh data, then that will uh, create new problems potentially. Um, the differences between FME desktop and server. So Laura's gonna spend a bit of time on that later on, uh, looking at that. And then uh, FME errors and crashes, which never happens, but uh, we'll mention it just in case it ever does happen. Yeah, so some of the symptoms of things going off the rails here. Oh, yes, at the bottom there, you've got that dreaded error running translation. I don't know if anyone's ever encountered that one, the, the generic error. Something went wrong, but you're not sure what. So we'll, we'll cover some tips on what to do in that case. Um, but yeah, like as everyone has said here, the, the FME log file is definitely the first stop for anything related to problems in your workspace. Um, so that'll show you all of the errors that may have occurred. Um, you can see here, just in the screenshot, this green arrow is pointing out um, uh, an additional feature of the log file as well. So in this case, uh, there was an error that happened trying to write a non-point feature to a point feature class, so probably going to a geodatabase or something along those lines. And the log has kind of written out the content of the record that was rejected. But right above that, it's also created a .ffs file. So it's a feature store file. So it actually has a copy of the data that was rejected. So it's a good place to go if you aren't really sure. Maybe you expected to have 100% um, points going through, but for some reason, some of them are being rejected. Everything looks good, uh, but you're not quite sure. So you can open up that FFS, FFS file uh, in the data inspector and take a look at that. Uh, so it's definitely useful. Uh, warning messages are another good one. Um, those can come in handy, especially if you're starting to see unexpected results in your output. So we've got an example down here going with File Geodatabase again. Uh, that warning there mentions that four text values were truncated during the write. So you might have seen in your output, maybe a few of your records are, are missing a chunk of text. Uh, so that would be a good clue to go and double check that your column widths are correct in your uh, writer feature type. Uh, another one here, unexpected and incorrect results. So yeah, it kind of covers a lot of the warning messages will, will show that. So they'll show that something didn't quite match up in your output or something along those lines. So the data may have been modified or potentially dropped as it was going through. Um, yeah, rejected data, no results. Again, the log file will often show what's going on there, but um, we'll look at some techniques for handling kind of other cases where maybe there's not much evidence in the log and, and it'll give you a chance to, to see what's going on and where your features are going or why they've gone missing perhaps during a translation there. So before diving into some of the um, troubleshooting tools, uh, when Laura and I were putting together the demo, we came up and we realized that we both have slightly different layouts of Workbench and Data Inspector. And so one of the things I would always suggest, I mean, not just around troubleshooting, but just working in Workbench is to get comfortable in Workbench and put together the layout that uh, you like to work with. So for example, at the top there, we've got um, the default menu and under the run button, there's the, the arrow pops down and there's a lot of options there on how you can run your workspace. And so I found that uh, one of them I use a lot is the rerun. And so I've just modified my toolbar just to put the rerun up there. And also I've put up on my toolbar uh, caching using breakpoints and toggling on and off visual preview because I sometimes feel that I get a better view if I work in Data Inspector. So I have it, the results pop up in Data Inspector instead. 
Uh, Laura, you had a slightly different uh, layout. What was your preference, please? Yes, my preference, yeah, was a little bit closer to the default, actually. I, I kept, yeah, I pulled out that rerun button as I tend to work with feature caching turned on a lot, and it's very handy for being able to refresh all those caches. Um, I tend not to turn caching on and off that much, so I don't bother uh, putting that button in, but I do work a lot with server, so I have pulled um, some download and publish to server buttons and brought those more to the forefront for mine. And then the other thing to remember is that you can move the windows around on your workbench as well, and Data Inspector actually. Mm -hmm. And so this this image here is just uh, my preferred layout that you're going to see in a, in a demo in a minute. Um, I mean, the key is to try and maximize the real estate that you have in Workbench when you're doing different tasks. You know, depending on whether you're just authoring, debugging, or whatever. And the same in Data Inspector. Uh, and then, of course, the choice between using Data Inspector and uh, Visual Preview. And actually, I use them both. Like, I find uh, Data Inspector is great when you're just looking at what I would call stable data. So, in this little workspace here, you might just want to have up the actual source data all the time as a reference point to what you're doing. So, that would be good to pop up into a Data Inspector window. And then visual preview can reflect the changes that are happening as you go through your works, your workspace and either troubleshoot or author your workbench. Yeah, so just, yeah, so the data inspector, that's the separate application um, that opens up basically the window and the display of your data versus the visual preview, which has you know, the, the, vis the view of your data directly embedded in Workbench itself. So they're basically the same thing, but one smaller, I guess, and stuck inside Workbench there. Yeah, I don't think I've actually used the separate data inspector in a couple of years myself. <laughs> I use it a lot. So I thought I would just uh, kick off with a bit of a contrived example. Like I was saying earlier on, it's kind of hard to find a workspace that just breaks on demand. So. Uh, and I'm sure in the audience that uh, everybody could, if we said, hey, send us a workspace that breaks, they could all send us one that we could run and it would break. But uh, anyway, here I have a, a little one that I've got up and running. It's just doing, a s the goal is to do a simple spatial relationship between some points that I have here and uh, some areas that uh, come from uh, the, uh, the data sets, the G admin 36 data sets, which are open source data sets for worldwide um, admin areas, fun data set to play around with. And uh, so we can rerun this. So the rerun button here that I've got exposed on my um, toolbar can just uh, start everything, refreshes the cache, refreshes the reread, and gets you going again. I'm expecting to get some overlaps here. And uh, somebody's already mentioned they really like um, the test filter for troubleshooting. So that's what I've used here. And I'm not getting any overlaps. So one of the things you can do in uh, Visual Preview is you can click on multiple objects on your screen and see how they, they sit. And uh, so that's what the data looks like. If you do prefer Data Inspector, you've got a Data Inspector window here so you can. Uh, tool tool here, so you can just pop up the data inspector window, which is open on a different screen. So you can get a bit of a bigger view of your data if you want. Uh, if you want that, so there's uh, the data inspector, and it does look like that data uh, should uh, overlap. Um, in both Visual Preview and Data Inspector, we've got the table view. Uh, and um, we've also got the feature information window. So this is the feature information window here. If I click on um, one of the records, the data pops up in there. And there's always a little bit more information in the feature information than there is in the table view. So the table view just gives you attributes that appear for what we call the workbench schema. And sometimes, for various reasons, attributes and information doesn't get onto that schema and they might be hidden here. And the obvious ones are um, format attributes. This is CSV data here. 
um, and uh, for the level three, that's um, geopackage data. So that's the format attributes for the geopackage. Um, and the other thing, information you get is uh, the information about the geometry of your feature. So that will be the coordinate system. And then down at the bottom, the um, geometry of the objects that you're playing around with. So um, lots of additional information potentially in the feature information. So if you can't see an attribute in here, um, then have a look in the feature information because it may have been get, may have been lost in the workbench schema. And other tools here that uh, can quickly help you kind of track down uh, information is restricting the number of columns that you look at. So if you only want the name uh, attributes, you can just uh, bring up those. So that will reduce the width of the data if you're playing around with a lot of data. This stuff is very transient. So, um, you know, you have to be patient because next time we click on something, that uh, configuration will disappear. So the problem in this case uh, is that uh, the data sets have uh, different coordinate systems. So we've got UTM over here and my CSV data is uh, coming in as WGS. So just adding a reprojector will solve the problem. Sorry, and what I meant to show there is that's where um, uh, the visual preview can be a little de deceptive because in visual preview, what we do by default is reproject everything that has a coordinate system that everything knows about to spherical Mercator. And uh, so the problem there is, is that I've got a UTM and a lat long coordinate system. They're all getting reprojected to spherical Mercator. And so it looks like they do overlap, which they do in space, but not in coordinate systems. And FME works in, uh, assumes everything's in the same coordinate system. So one thing you can do if weird things are going on um, with uh, data that you think should overlap is just to turn the background maps off. And um, then you'll see, well, you won't see here because they're so, so disparately apart you see that the data doesn't actually overlap because um, uh, they're in weird uh, different places. So uh, in terms of coordinate systems. So that's, uh, that's one thing to remember there is you can turn off the background maps to actually see whether the data is overlapping. Okay, so we can just add in a reprojector. use our test filter and uh, run to this. So that will bring everything that's out of date in our cache. Uh, the yellow reprojector hasn't been run yet, so it's not got any cache. The yellow means it's out of date. So run to this as um, I bring that in and uh, okay, looks like we're getting the overlaps we need. So I'm gonna connect up and uh, I'm gonna write out those areas to Esri Mobile as well. And what you can also do here is you can select a number of uh, objects that you want to run to, and then you can right click and you've got different options um, for running. So you can run to selected. You actually I just learned this the other day, uh, run between selected. So you can select two transformers on your workbench and run the results between those two. I didn't uh, hadn't encountered that before. Have you ever used that, uh, Laura? No, I think this is the first time I've noticed it too. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Should look at the menus more often, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess those do change sometimes. <laughs> okay. And uh, there's uh, an error popping up there that uh, Laura's uh, already started to mention. We've got the uh, error filters here that's um, coming up. Uh, in red and uh, we can track down no uh, point, uh, can't write a non-point feature to our Esri mobile and that's because, well, that's weird, geodatabase point. Okay, so maybe it's something wrong with the uh, spatial relator. So I'm just gonna uh, 
um, save all that. I don't want to work with that. I'm going to duplicate that, create another test. So that's when you're fiddling around with work transformers and experimenting, you know, disabling uh, different transformers is a good thing to do. I've got a point on area overlay that I'm going to try here to see if I can get a better result. Um, connect up the areas there. Got the points coming across and that's a slightly different uh, attribute. Overlaps attribute and um, hash values yet, but then some of the transformers you can actually select the values from the feature cache once the transform is being run. Well, in this case, it would be the point on area overlayer that we would need to run. So let's uh, see if we get a better result there. And uh, that's crashed. So this is a rejected, an example of a rejected port where um, something's gone wrong in the transformer itself. And it's again saying that um, didn't like that geometry. And what you can also do in Visual Preview, if you select that item, there's usually a terse message, the FME rejection uh, code that gives you some kind of message as to why this particular object got rejected. So that's always worth looking at. And again, that won't appear in the table view. It's just in the feature information window. So that's uh, our problem there. So somehow we're getting non-point geometries uh, in here. So one thing I wanted to just illustrate was a tool that's been in FME for a long, long time. I'm going to disable this just while we're tracking that down. And um, is uh, the idea of breakpoints. And uh, so you can click on a link and you can add a breakpoint, which is this big symbol pops up here. Uh, under the uh, run options, there's an option to run with breakpoints. I've got that on my toolbar because I do use them once in a while. So actually this was our first stab at feature caching and uh, breakpoints have been in FME for a long time, but feature caching has in many ways made them redundant. But uh, what you can do is you can run with breakpoints. And so if I rerun breakpoints toggled on, it's going to stop at that first breakpoint and show us the results at that exact point in time. And then we can decide how we want to proceed. So we can inspect that single feature. So this is great if a single or a small number of features are causing features to be rejected when you're writing to a database or something. It allows you to really pick through the data step by step and see where the problem is occurring. And now at the bottom here, we've got different options for running. So I could add another breakpoint and run to that. Here I could uh, add another breakpoint there. Or in this case, I can just step to the next connection. So that's the result of this particular uh, process, which is the vertex creator in this case. And uh, it seems that the problem lies with the vertex creator. It's creating an extra point. And um, and in this case, the reason is, is that the CSV reader is uh, smart enough to, when we look at the user attributes, to pick out the lat long as XY coordinates. And then what I've done is I've added a vertex creator, which says add a point. So it's adding another point and so duplicating that point. So for CSV in Excel, you often don't need a vertex creator. You can just get away without uh, anything there. And um, so we can stop the translation from running, toggle off breakpoints. Oh, one other thing about breakpoints is there's a lot of, quite a lot of sophistication in there. So if I add that and then I right click and edit the breakpoint, you've got all sorts of filters. So you can put test clauses in as to when the breakpoint will occur, or you can actually just do feature count. So you can say, stop after 2000 features, something like that. So there's quite a lot of sophistication in there that you can play around with. Can I jump in for a yeah. second? Yeah. Um, just, yeah, one other thing about breakpoints that I find useful too sometimes um, is that it gives you a way to, to trace how 
features move through a workspace. You can see here when Mark was going through, you could see one uh, feature came from the CSV reader into the reprojector and then out to the next transformer in sequence. And you could see them kind of going through one at a time through each transformer. But you can also see when they start to kind of cluster at um, one of these, uh, what are they called, grouped group by transformers, where Locals. they have to do processing on multiple records. So you can kind of see them pool up at those different transformers. So you can see when they go through individually and when they go through as a group, when they have to stop at a particular transformer before moving on. That's a great point. And you can see that here as I've been clicking through. I'm not going to go through all 30,000 features, but uh, you can see they're all waiting in the point on area overlay and there's nothing coming out and that will carry on until we've gone through 30,000 features and then it's read all the areas and then come out the end there that's a great point thanks Laura stop that okay and then let's uh, get that down there and uh, rerun that Oops, did I not turn off uh, breakpoints? Everything should be a bit happier. So, and so there you can see that I've disabled the transformers that I'm experimenting with, um, checked out uh, uh, what I the, found the transformers I actually want to use to get the result I want and then once I'm happy with that we can just uh, delete the transformers we don't really need anymore and uh, annotate our workspace in a nice way and uh, continue on with uh, our workflow development. Uh, just one thing again just going back to that idea of table view if you click on a transformer that's got two ports, you can you'll see both of the results in the table view there that you can toggle between. Or if you pick on just one of the items, you'll see the little eye pops up, the symbol change from eye. So that's the ones you're looking at. And again, just to illustrate the differences in the um, table view and feature information, particularly around lists, table view doesn't usually show you any lists. So in the point and area overlayer. Um, I'm creating a list attribute of what the areas are overlapping with those points. That's appearing here in my um, feature information window that the list it, that was created, but it wouldn't appear in the table view. So do always poke around in feature information if you um, are working in lists as well. Okay, so. Tools for troubleshooting in Workbench, just to summarize that, feature caching, visual preview, and um, uh, you know, run to this or run from that. Those are all really excellent tools. Uh, these little, when you get the slides, um, and uh, we forgot to mention that uh, you'll get an email with the recording and the slides uh, as follow-up. And I think um, Elizabeth was gonna post the slides up as we were talking, actually. So these are links to various articles that you can uh, investigate these tools a bit further. So feature caching does um, fall down um, in some cases or it becomes a bit more awkward to work with. So very large workspaces, you can run out of file handles. Um, I, that's the number of cache files just exceeds what your operating system might be able to handle. Um, and so in that case, you can collapse bookmarks. So feature caches aren't built with inside collapsed bookmarks. So if you collapse a bookmark, then that kind of effectively reduces the number of cache files that are created. So if you just want to focus on one area of your workspace with the feature caches that, and a workspace that has a large number of transformers um, or a bigger amount of data, then um, collapse your bookmarks. Um, Feature caching doesn't always give the results you want. So some transformers, um, you know, the ordering of features uh, is important and feature caching can mess up the order of features. Uh, the point on area um, overlay a transformer has an option that allows you to um, improve the performance if you can get the areas in first. Uh, same with clipper, clipper first. And uh, so if you use those, the feature caching might mess that up. You might have to turn that option off. So 
and workflows that really rely on the order of features uh, may not work as expected with feature caching. And feature caching isn't so good with very large data sets and rasters or LIDAR. And that's particularly with raster and LIDAR, FME has a, the concept of delayed process, processing for raster and LIDAR, and it only starts processing once it figures out what it actually needs to process. And um, so uh, feature caching messes with that because the rasters are not only cached every step of the way, but the processing is done every step of the way. Also in visual preview, I would suggest turning off the background maps for rasters because your raster is going to get reprojected to the spherical mercator at every step of the, every time you view them and that can be a little bit tedious and um, so turn off background maps when working with raster. Uh, data inspector and visual preview mentioned the graphics view, the table view and the slight differences between table view and feature information. Breakpoints, so there's a link to the documentation there, kind of an old tool in FME that is still very useful in some cases. Uh, happily disable objects and connectors as you're debugging your and troubleshooting just to try and narrow down where the problem might occur. And then if you do get something coming out of a rejected port, um, have a look at that FME rejection code that might give you a clue as to what's going wrong there. And a little bit more uh, on repetition on data uh, inspector, uh, background maps, doesn't always tell the truth. We had a look at that. So uh, maybe turn it off because if you've got data from two different projections, uh, they may look like they're overlapping. Table view doesn't always tell the truth. The attributes might not be on the workbench schema. So check your feature information. Um, and don't forget that when you are using feature caching, you can select multiple objects on your workbench canvas and see all of that in one. Yeah, so just some additional tools for troubleshooting in workbench here. Um, so yeah, I think we kind of briefly mentioned this earlier as well, but logging is huge. Always look at your log file there. Um, you'll notice that uh, our log windows probably look a little different than what you're used to seeing. Um, so we're using FME 2022 here for a lot of our demos. Um, so we've revamped the log file there uh, to help make it easier to kind of tie the messages that you're seeing directly to the transformers um, that are kind of related to any errors or warnings or anything along those lines. Uh, so those links are very useful. Um, I'll show some examples of that coming up. Uh, but you can click on any of those lines and it'll help highlight which transformer um, is spitting out that message. So it helps pinpoint things, especially if you have a larger workspace. Um, so if you've got something with a few hundred transformers in it and you got to find that one database joiner that's caused a problem, uh, it definitely helps to be able to, to jump there quickly. Um, yeah, so the spatial log file again is also a, a really useful um, tool in, in certain cases, especially if you are seeing unexpected errors and there's something not quite right with your data, but you can't quite see it directly from the log, uh, it provides a good snapshot of the exact pieces of data that are causing problems. So you can open that up and take a look at it. Uh, yeah, so that's just here. Um, if you ever need to figure out where that FFS file is going, it's typically saved in the same directory as your log file. So that'll usually be in the same directory as the workspace that you're building and working with. Uh, if you need to check it, the location is always specified just before uh, the log messages that output uh, the details of the records that are being written to that uh, FFS file there. And then finally, debug logging. So this is another one that's useful uh, in certain cases where you're seeing error messages, but you're not getting quite enough detail to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, if you go into um, FME options under translation and this log message filter section, uh, you have the ability to check this log debug option. And this will basically spit out a whole bunch of additional detail directly into your log file about exactly what's happening in your workspace. Um, in many cases, it spits out way more information than you could ever need. But there are certain cases where it will spit out information that will be helpful, um, particularly if you're dealing with things like the HTTP caller or SQL executors and SQL creators. Um, I find particularly with HTTP caller, 
uh, if you're having issues connecting out to a web application or a website uh, to download data, and you maybe you're using a proxy or some kind of fancy authentication with OAuth or something along those lines, uh, the debug logging will actually spit out more information about exactly what's happening, which calls are failing, and kind of what requests are going out and what the responses look like. And then the same for the SQL executor and creator. Uh, the debug logging will actually spit out uh, what SQL is being uh, run when something goes wrong. So you can see the exact statement that's being called and you can test that directly with your database to make sure everything looks good in that case. Um, simplifying your data when authoring. I think for me, this is really, really important if you can do it. Sometimes it's difficult to do, like if you're merging different data sets, then the, the workspace may not be successful because you know you might not have reached the data yet that you need to merge. So that can be a bit tricky. But if you keep on running with the full data set every time, it's going to get very, very tedious when you hit a problem. So reduce the volume of data whenever you can. It will really, really speed up your work for authoring and troubleshooting. So lots of handy transformers and uh, for simplifying your data and parameters as well. So the test filter, great tool for filtering. Actually, I, there's the tester and test filter. I always prefer the test filter because it actually names the output port. You can name the output port so you know what's going on. Um, sampler, very simple to use, just reduces the number of data that you're reading. On the readers, you've got max features to read. Um, uh, you've got the feature types to read to limit the number of feature types that you're reading. So all those are great for reducing the volume of data when you can. Yeah, so this uh, workspace compare, so that's another new feature for FME 2022. I guess there's okay, it's a couple of things here. Actually, we'll start with Workbench Search. So this is something that's been around forever. Um, in the navigator window, you'll see the option to search within your workspace. Um, so I find this really useful if you're trying to trace um, where something might be happening in your workspace. Um, for me, sometimes like I find uh, a particular attribute value isn't what I expected, and I need to trace back kind of where that attribute came from and where it's used in the workspace. Uh, so I can use that workspace, uh, that workspace search to look for a particular attribute name. And that'll actually show me every single transformer or format or reader or writer that uses that attribute. So it gives an easy way to figure out where it was created in the workspace and where it's being used. It's also good if you need to switch, say, an attribute name, you need to figure out where, what's using the old one. You can find that all quickly and easily there and start switching those out. So it's definitely helpful. Um, and it has some advanced options too. So you could search for exact strings, wildcard searches, or do some, some fancy advanced ones looking for, for things in a larger workspace. Um, the other piece here is workspace compare. Uh, so this is a new feature in 2022. And this gives the ability to kind of do a visual diff between two different workspaces. Um, so we have a link here to more information about that. We won't be demonstrating it too much for today, but it can be useful if you're debugging uh, say a workspace that had been working perfectly one day, but then you went in and made a few changes and now you're getting unexpected results or error messages. Um, it's definitely something I've done before where I've got something that works fine and I have to go fiddle with it and, and break something. Um, so this gives you the chance to compare the two workspaces and see kind of what you did and try to trace back uh, what change may have caused some problems there. So isolating issues. Um, so this is again, another useful uh, tool, especially when dealing with maybe larger or more complex data sets, or if you need to potentially get a coworker or maybe somebody from our support team to, to help you with an issue that you're seeing in your workspace. Uh, this provides a way to kind of take an, a sample of the data that you're working with and save that um, to send to somewhere else or to work with kind of outside of your production environment. Uh, so one option here is the ability to save as a template. You can actually store the feature cache with a template. So when you go to save, um, you'll have the ability to include feature caches. So all you have to do is run the workspace once with caching turned on and then choose the option to save as template and you can save each of those feature cache files directly into the template. 
So then if you were to send that on to someone or use that separately, uh, you could open that up and have the caches exactly as they are. So you have the workspace kind of in the same state that it was in last time you ran it. Um, some other useful tools are the recorder and player transformers. So the recorder basically lets you drop in that transformer and take a copy of the data that goes into it. So you can get a snapshot of what the data looks like at that point. So I find that particularly useful if you're working with a database or maybe a web format, something you don't necessarily want to hit every single time you run your workspace. You can just take a, a user recorder, uh, take a recording of that data, and then use the player to play that back. So you can use that copy locally instead of having to go out to whatever external source you're getting that from. Uh, and then finally, the sampler is another good one. I think Mark touched on this a little bit as well, but that lets you yeah, just take a smaller sampling of the data that you're working with. So if you've got a million records that you're working with and something's not going quite right or you're building your workspace, uh, you probably don't want to wait for all million records to flow through every single time you make a small adjustment. So you can do a sampling of, say, a random set of your data or just a few records to go through and test before you run the full set. I think at this point we have a poll. Uh, so Elizabeth, are you able to run that for us? Perfect. Yeah, so everyone take a few moments here to fill out the poll. Have you seen any new troubleshooting ideas that you might want to try? And a few options there. All right, votes starting to trickle in now. We'll give everyone maybe yeah, five more seconds or so. The breakpoint seems to be out in the lead here. That's one of those features I think that's kind of hidden. We don't really talk about a whole lot in FME. So. Well, it was it was kind of uh, replaced with feature caching, and uh, mm. but it's still there and it still has its place for really digging in deep. All right, so just take a quick look here. Um, one other aspect of debugging here is if anyone uses Python scripts in their workspaces. This is always a little bit of a, a different beast to work with just because it it's not quite as visual or as as simple to to use when especially if it's embedded directly within workbench itself um, so you see errors typically what will happen is it'll say something like python script failed to run and then spit out a copy of the entire script with maybe a little bit of an error showing a bit of a clue of what went wrong but it does make it tricky to figure out what's happening um, so you see Python scripts in a few places in Workbench, in the Python caller, startup and shutdown scripts, as well as scripted parameters. And each of those have subtleties in how they run and the different places that logging or errors may show up, depending on um, if they run on Workbench versus FME server as well. Um, so Python caller tends to be fairly straightforward. If you put pr uh, print statements in there or anything like that, you'll see them directly in the log file and in all contexts. Uh, but with the startup and shutdown scripts, those run either before or after the workspace itself has run. Um, so especially with shutdown, that'll actually run after the log file has closed. So when you're running in Workbench, um, it'll still, you'll, if you have print statements in those shutdown scripts, uh, those statements will appear in the log window, but they're not actually written to the log file. Um, so in Workbench, it doesn't really matter, so you'll just see it in the place you'd expect it. But if you run this on FME server, You'll actually see if you check the log file, um, the print statements aren't present in the job log. They'll end up being caught by a different log file on server. So I'll take a look, uh, I'll show you where that goes, uh, just in case you do have to deal with shutdown scripts and that. But yeah, troubleshooting approaches for Python, typically print statements are, are your best friend here. Um, if I'm having issues with my script, I tend to place those in various locations within my script strategically just to see of where it's getting and, and see kind of how far along things run before there are issues. Uh, the other tip that I'd have is if you're building complex strip scripts, um, it's probably best to, to develop those directly in a Python editor outside of Workbench so you can use all the debugging tools that are directly in there. And then you could import those scripts or that .py file into FME and run that um, after you know it's working. And debugging an FME server. So I'll have a quick example coming up here, just a couple of things. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the tips that we have reviewed already would apply to FME server. But um, 
things like feature caching or using visual preview uh, won't be available on the FME server itself. So it does make troubleshooting a little bit difficult at times because you are running a little bit blind. All you really have is the log file to work from there. Um, so my first tip here for working with FME server, if the workspace doesn't run correctly there, download that and test it on FME desktop first. Uh, if you're seeing the same errors there, it's much easier to see exactly what's going on and use all of the tools available uh, to test it and figure out what's happening. But there are circumstances where things will work fine on desktop, but not on FME server. So the key thing I can say is to look at differences between those two environments. Often your FME servers on a different machine uh, may have different permissions. It may not be able to access particular file paths that you're referencing directly in your workspace. Um, dependencies are another piece that tend to go wrong when you're publishing up to FME server. So you could be missing custom transformers or Python modules, web and database connections and that. Uh, the other piece is mismatched FME versions. So typically when that happens, if you've created a workspace, say in FME Workbench 2022, and you've published that up to an FME server 2019, so it's an older version of server, uh, you'll find that you'll get kind of ugly error messages in those cases. And it'll often say, could not find some factory name, uh, and then it'll fail with that. And that's usually a clue that you've got uh, versions that don't match. So it's always the first thing to take a look at is what version of FME did you create your workspace in? And what version of FME are you running it on in FME server? Let's take a look at a quick example here. So let me open that up here. So I've got a workspace. Um, this one's just reading from a shapefile and writing out to a geodatabase. So I'm using a custom transformer and I also have a Python script inside. I actually just realized I meant to have that as a shutdown script. So I'm just gonna move that quickly. Sorry, here we go. So if I run this on desktop, it'll work for the most part. I'm expecting a bit of an error just so I can show a little piece of this on server. It worked. Okay. Yes, there we go. So I'm getting some messages about uh, the writer here. So I have a mismatch in the, here we go, the geometry. So I'm writing out uh, points to a polyline uh, table in my geodatabase. So I'm just going to show what happens on server if you wanted to find that FFS file in that case. So I'm going to publish this up to server here. So you can see first off, it's going to give me a little warning about linked transformers. So I have this custom transformer inside. So it's telling me I'll need to publish this separately in order to be able to use it. So I'll continue anyway. And I'll publish that up. Oops. Hmm. Well, some troubleshooting right from the start here was working earlier. Do I have my username incorrect? I guess I do. All right, let's try publishing this differently then. So I have FME server here. And I'm going to publish this up to new repository. Locate my workspace file here. This guy, oops, here we go. Putting it into test. This is just showing the upload directly through the web interface in this case. And I'll say confirm and publish that up. Okay, so here we go. I'll locate my repository and I'll run my job. So first thing here, yeah, so I've forgotten the custom transformer. So it's going to give me a failure saying, can't find the geographic length calculator. Um, so I'll need to make sure that's installed in my workspace. So this is great. Um, this provides a nice, clear, easy to follow error message. Uh, message. But um, I wanted to show some behavior here. So if I was to go into my job, 
I didn't have that up and kind of following the job status as it ran, and I just came in here, saw my job had failed and opened it up, I'll see something like this, which can be a little bit scary. So I do see a lot of people panic when they get to this point. So it's like, why is there no log here? What has happened? There's no evidence of anything going on. Um, so what happens in this case, uh, typically what's gone wrong is that there's been an error before the job has actually run. Um, so the, this is happening before the, the log file is even created. Um, so this might look scary, but it's never, it's not usually that bad of an issue. Um, so typically things that will happen in this case is maybe a Python startup script caused a failure before the job started. Uh, it can happen if prerequisites are missing. So in our case, we've got a custom transformer that's missing. So it's kind of scanned through the workspace and seen that it's not there. So it's not even going to try to run it. Or you could be missing a published parameter value. So maybe a required parameter has not been set for some reason. Um, and if you need to figure out what's going on in this case, you can actually check the result data here. Um, so this is where that status message that was captured earlier will appear. So if you're seeing something like this, always good to check the result data and that'll show you um, a message about what may have happened in that case. So if it was a Python issue, it would show here as well. So what I can do is go to fix this. So I can just place my custom transformer into my resources so it's available. So I'll just place that in here. Oops. I just have that FMX file handy and now I can rerun that job and that should get further this time. So in this case, this is a good example of missing data sets. So if I go into the details here, I can see in the message, shapefile readers failed to open this file. So this is referencing a path that's local to um, my desktop, for example. So one common reason for this, um, you might see it pointing to like C program files, your username slash um, data directory. Uh, so this will happen if the file paths are pointing to the wrong location. You'll also see this if maybe you're pointing to a file share and the user running the FME server services doesn't have permission to see that file. So again, that'll always appear in the log window here. I can filter if I wanted to find just the error and just go straight to that. This is useful if you're dealing with a very long log file as well. So I can rerun this. I can upload my school's zip file. and run again. And finally here, I've got an FME and Python failure. So this will be the last thing I show. But what's interesting is if I open up my details and look through my log, you'll see here at the very end, it says the Python script is specified and it'll run after the translation is complete. You'll see here, if I look at the log, there's no evidence that anything actually went wrong. So it just shows that my job failed, but we don't see that anything happened. And this is because that Python script is running after the log file has closed. Uh, so it doesn't get captured directly in the job log. So any information about a shutdown Python script is going to end up in the engine log file for FME server. So the engine process itself will catch those error messages and it will record it in its own log file and not one that's directly related to this job. So if you need to find that, uh, you can find that from the logs or in the resources folder of FME server. If you go to logs and engine, so it'll be specific to the engine that was running the job. So here it says FME process monitor engine log. So I can open that up, scroll down to the bottom, and here I can see the actual errors that were coming back from that shutdown script. So in my case here, I've got an unexpected input or an unexpected indent in my Python script it's saying line 22. So I can take a look at the indentation in my script and fix that up. So if you are ever seeing unexpected errors, especially with a shutdown script, um, this process monitor engine log is a great place to look. This is also helpful if you do see um, maybe a job log kind of cuts off out of nowhere in FME server. That can sometimes indicate there was a crash for some reason. Um, and you can always come to this process monitor engine log and then it'll show um, evidence of what may have happened. So you could see if the job rant um, cut off unexpectedly or something else may have gone wrong in that case. 
And I'll just take a moment to note at this point, we'll be going a few minutes over time. If you aren't able to stay past that 9 a.m. mark, no worries. We'll be sure to send out the full recording after. Yeah, I think at this point it's mostly wrap up too, so you're not missing out too much anymore. Yeah, so we're wrapping up here with some things that we're not really going to cover too in depth. The links are there. Um, travel, performance troubleshooting. We haven't really talked about looking at the timings in the log file in detail, but that's where you can see where the time is going for each of the transformers, and then you can try and track those down. So there's quite a lengthy article uh, on performance troubleshooting, so have a look at that. Database errors, well, that's a whole other deep dive in its own uh, right. So just some quick thoughts on that. Um, often the errors are buried in a transaction. So if your transaction interval is a thousand records, when the database tries to um, sub, uh, commit that transaction, that whole transaction will fail and roll back and buried in there somewhere will be the single bad feature potentially that caused that failure. So that's kind of a bit hard for FME to record which, which record it was. So you can then uh, in the Dan debugging process, just try switching to a transaction interval of one. Um, and that's kind of a, a place where breakpoints are really helpful as well. And step through until you um, encounter the problem and then find the bad feature or whatever is causing the uh, rejection. Um, just remember that when you save a workspace template, um, it doesn't encompass the database data. Um, so, because the workspace template is really just a zip file with all the data that it can find in data files. Uh, so you'd have to use a recorder player combination to save any database data that you might want to send us or a colleague to help debug. Um, SQL scripts might fail, so check that they are working in your appropriate database manager. And similar to what Laura was saying earlier on, make sure the permissions that you're running Workbench under uh, match the um, permissions that uh, you're testing under. And then sometimes you might uh, be very useful to dig out the database system logs, go to your database administrator and match the log uh, timings with the time that you ran your FME job and see what was the cause of a database transaction failure. And uh, often that might be timeouts. That's a very common cause of large database job failures. So uh, see if you can dig out the database logs. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, and just some tips on some best practices, um, especially if you are wanting to version your workspaces and see the changes as you're going. Um, there's a couple different ways to handle that. Um, so if you're wanting to use Workspace Compare when that comes out with our release soon, um, it's a good idea to kind of version or save copies of your workspace as you're going. Um, so I know what Mark does is he typically puts in the date when he last edited a workspace. You'll have multiple copies of that with the date that he changed something um, directly on his system. So that makes it easy to open up both versions of the workspace from different dates and view those. Uh, the other option is when you're publishing to FME server, if you have version control turned on there, um, you can keep publishing the same copy of a workspace with the same name and commit new versions as you make changes. So then you'll have the whole history and the commits uh, directly in FME server and you can download different copies of the workspace from different periods of time. Uh, here we've got a couple of links for workspace best practices. So the first link is to, um, I think it's a question that uh, Mark Ireland put out there on the community. So um, definitely a useful uh, article just showing an example of a workspace that can scan other workspaces and check for best practices. Uh, we also have um, a course on the FME Academy simply about best practices, how to use annotations properly, checking for repetition, and, and dealing with that. I guess one question we had here is renaming transformers. I know some people like to do that as part of their best practices, so renaming them to, to tell exactly what they're doing versus keeping the original names of those transformers. So I've always find that an interesting one. I personally I never read it. Uh, you and I vote for leaving the transformer names alone. Isn't that right, Laura? Yeah, I always find it easier just knowing what the transformer is uh, versus having a descriptive title. But I know some people 
don't quite work that way. So if you disagree with us, it'd be interesting to hear about that. I think Laura and I prefer to add an annotation to say what why you're doing something. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, and I can write paragraphs about what I'm up to so I can read it later on in the future if I have to come back to it. Just a quick summary of what we've covered here. Yeah, so um, we've just run through what it looks like when you do encounter some issues, uh, tools for troubleshooting workspace. Yep, and we just looked at some testing and debugging on the FME server side as well. So just a few nuances there and subtleties and yeah, definitely relying heavily on the log file in the FME server environment. Uh, yeah, so we've got a, a collection of links to resources here as well. So again, we'll be sharing out the slide deck after the webinar. So don't panic if you can't uh, get all of these right away. But these are definitely great resources for debugging and learning a little bit about some of the different features that we showed today. All right, and as a thank you for you all joining us here today, we have a community badge code that you can redeem, PSLGW. And I'll leave that up on the screen for a few moments here and drop it in the chat. And with that, if you're able to stick around, we'll take a couple minutes here just to look over any Q&A. Just uh, while it's at the forefront, that uh, question around renaming Transformers. Uh, user conference last week, um, in two or three of the sessions I was in, that to same topic came up. And it seems more controversial than uh, I would have thought it was. So quite a few people were uh, transformer renamers and they put uh, what the transform was doing uh, and others were saying oh no you never do that just use an annotation so <laughs> it's a big much more controversial than you might think <laughs> there was a, a group of people there that was kind of doing the, the best of both worlds where they'd leave the, the name of the transform at the beginning of the transformer name and then just add their notes to the end of the transformer name when they're renaming them so you kind of That's still have the original right. one and then you've got your modification so around some of the questions, uh, somebody had asked for a little bit more detail on uh, debugging Python scripts and uh, uh, before and sh um, shut down Python scripts. And I think Laura went into a lot of detail on that. So I'm not sure whether we need to dig much more in there. Did you see any others um, caught your eye there, Laura? I'm just Early on, I think um, Elizabeth had asked uh, what the favorite debugging tools are, and somebody said, well, I like to open up the workbench in a text file and, and it, look into it. Um, so in general, I would not recommend that. I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. And anybody who fiddles around with that uh, text file and then wants some help from our support team are probably going to get a pretty abrupt answer, I think. <laughs> So I wouldn't wouldn't totally recommend that unless you really really understand the syntax of the um, underlying um, XML and JSON now as well. Uh, there was a bit of discussion in the chat about um, uh, setting up um, local communities. That was something we we um, sort of have discussed on and off uh, quite a while ago. Um, and we didn't re really get too much uptake because I think the FME community itself has served that purpose. And, you know, the reach of the FME community is is worldwide. And we have people in Europe ask, answering questions, uh, you know, of people, anybody posts up there. So, um, so I would try the user community that as it exists now. But if you do want, want to sponsor a local community, you can talk to us. Um, and uh, we can look into how we might do that. But we, in the past, we have tried that, and we haven't had a great deal of uptake on people wanting to sponsor a local community. I see one question's come in here related to troubleshooting FME server API requests. So they're saying sometimes web app sends a job to server, and then it kind of just vanishes into nowhere, I guess. Um, yeah, so I guess that's not a topic we really covered in this webinar. Um, yeah, with the API requests, uh, those are ones where it's fairly common to be missing published parameter values and things like that, where if the job does get submitted and you actually see it register in the server interface, um, you can go there and check 
the status there. And that's often where you'll see there's no log file because there's errors about the parameters being sent in. I think in your situation here, if the job's actually just disappearing, um, it makes it a bit more complicated to figure out. Uh, generally, when I'm troubleshooting things like that, I'll look at the kind of the web application layer in FME server. So you have Tomcat that runs the web app portion. Uh, in there, there's a couple of logs, um, either Catalina or the localhost access log. And those will show you if there was, like, if there's any evidence of the request making it through. So you could see if um, maybe the request was badly formatted or an error was bounced back from the server interface that um, maybe was a little bit unusual or something along those lines. So it's generally where I'd check to see if the job made it through to server. Um, if it's not making it through at all, then you're probably looking at network or, or other issues with the, the application that's actually sending the requests. But those can be complicated depending on exactly how it's set up in that. But we're always happy to help you out in, in the support team as well if you need anything there. Awesome. And I think that covers us off there on the questions, unless I'm missing anything, Laura and Mark. No, I think that was it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Perfect. All right. And with that, thank you everyone so much for joining us here today. If you do have a moment to let us know what you thought about the webinar today, we do have a few brief multiple choice questions in that FME server app link I just posted. And then also, as always, if you do have any questions that come up after the webinar, definitely reach out to us, info at safe.com, and we're happy to chat about anything data. And thanks to our presenters as well, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.